is getting a little bit more complicated when they really form a single black hole, yeah? And then uh, the single black hole thins down to make a nice, beautiful, beautiful billiard ball, yeah? Why do we need this simulation? We need this simulation because we will match the simulation to the data, and I will show you how beautifully this numerical simulation matches the data what we had seen. Yeah? <coughs> uh, but before I do that, let me show you something historical. This is the most important historical figure with the three people who will be the answer uh, to your question. Who is my bet for the Nobel Prize? My bet for the Nobel Prize are uh, this uh, uh, great uh, scientist, Ron Cleaver, Rick Thorne, and Ray Weiss. Yeah? Ray is an amazing person. When I was working in the electronics shop, 2 a.m., he was working there with me. Very, very uh, motivating. So, they made this prediction. They made this prediction in 1987. <coughs> I, was, I was cleaning the floor in the army. 1987, <laughs> and they had fun making this, yeah? uh, and they predicted that this is what we will see, yeah? and I want to emphasize two predictions of that, x-axis is frequency, y-axis is noise, high noise, high, low noise, low, yeah? so what you see here is um, the <coughs> green line is the LIGO noise, this is what they predicted for advanced LIGO, and this is pretty much uh, where we will be for advanced LIGO. We are very close to this. And you see that LIGO is sensitive between uh, 10 to 1,000 hertz, really the audible range. And uh, you can see that if we would have uh, 10 solar mass black holes, then they would get closer and closer and closer and closer together, then ring down. Yeah? And this yellow region is the signal to noise ratio what we get out of LIGO if they happen at 100 megaparsecs, yeah? 100 million parsecs. Now, what happens if 100 solar mass black holes happen uh, 4 gigaparsecs away? Then, what happens is this the blue line. Yeah? So, what you see is that if the black holes are heavier, then they merge earlier, so only part of the signal space is used. This means that this low frequency range is critical. The low frequency range is critical because all the heavier black holes are there. Yeah? And that's key. That's key because that is the frequency region advanced LIGO gains. So whenever somebody tells you that, well, advanced LIGO is three times better than initial LIGO, that person is not telling the truth. Advanced LIGO is better factor of 3, around 100 to 100 hertz. But it is infinitely better in the 10 to 60 hertz region because we didn't see that region at all before. Yeah? And guess what? That's where the black holes are. <coughs> so, advanced light is good for black holes. Yeah? So, uh, isn't it amazing? 1987, on the spot, they deserve the Nobel Prize, in my opinion. Yeah? And here is a comparison of uh, initial LIGO and advanced LIGO, and you see that shady region, that is where advanced LIGO is a lot better than initial LIGO ever was, yeah? And this gives us a lot of signal to noise ratio for binary black holes. And uh, this is what we had seen, and uh, uh, you will see this again from Ibre, the only thing I want to emphasize here is that this is the signal recorded by the light observatories, yeah, Washington and Livingston. This is the black hole simulation, yeah, and the difference is really just not. There's a beautiful fit from the simulation and the recording waveform, yeah. So, so we really, we really understand what happened there. And, uh, uh, do we have a single paper about this? No, we wrote a PRL. We made the uh, one as for a choice. We published in PRL. That's the Journal of the Physics Community. And we published uh, uh, a dozen follow-up papers uh, detailing this discovery. And we are so happy that we made it to the PRL cover. Yeah? Um, we take a lot 
lot of work. Well, it took a lot of work. Uh, this is the fact sheet, yeah? And uh, I want to emphasize uh, the CPU hours used for this. 50 million hours of CPU for that thing. It's a lot of CPU, yeah? We were working like crazy. <laughs> and, uh, and just one number. The amount of energy radiated in gravitational waves, three solar masses, okay? Three of our suns was radiated away in gravitational waves in this process. Yeah? 5,000 times more than our sun did ever radiate. Yeah? This is energy. This is total. Ah. <laughs> yeah. So, so in we will come back to that, but, but this is amazing science from amazing instruments, and uh, um, what you need is an amazing instrument, and I will pass the button here to our instrument expert, Juja, who built part of the Dirkman Slido. Matter of fact, other observatories worldwide. First stop is on three continents, and I think uh, it, is, uh, it is a wonderful machine measuring one millionth of a cent on the U.S. national debt. <laughs> <laughs>
fiber priority thing. We, of course, when we do have that, we have to make sure we are recycling the <coughs> beam as well. So we have to have recycling mirror as well. So really, uh, we have developed a lot of power in the arms. It has a thinness of a couple hundred, the arms. And then, what these arms are actually doing, this is amplifying the phase measurement. Because actually, I said, yeah, okay, what we are measuring is its phase, but actually what we are measuring is a change in phase between the two <coughs> arms uh, when the gravitational rate comes by and compresses or stretches one of the arms or the other. Okay? So this is what we are doing. Uh, this is Manhattan. I mean, we are not in New York, but we does have an idea. I actually didn't measure the, the LIGO looking uh, figure there. That, that's the size of the defibrillator. It's really fun. You can go to the side and bicycle from the central station to the from the mid corner station to the end station and back. It's really fun, it's exercise, so it's not just like work there and body suits and so on. There is more to that. Okay. So this is what we measured and some of you already had this one up. This is the sensitivity curve uh, during this run, the last O1 run during the event actually. And this is the previous science run of initial LIGO. And this is the blue here. This big change, and we are talking about orders of magnitude change in the sensitivity at those low frequencies. That allows us to really make the protection this time. We have been advertising that what LIGO is going to be doing, and we were telling this is our range. I know we said 80 megaparsec. This was the range, and this is the range in binary neutron stars. And that's totally true for binary neutron stars, but when we are looking for the metals, we can see so much farther. This event was coming from 410 megaparsecs away. So, and we would have seen it. We would have claimed detection if we had, if it was coming from twice the distance. This is really that amazing. All right. So this really figure tells you the interferometer uh, <coughs> uh, conditions when we were operating it for this mm -hmm. last science one. So mm -hmm. we only had 20 watt uh, in going uh, far from our laser source. So <coughs> it's capable to 200. So we are going to have a lot more farming. We can really boost up the laser power, which means we are going to come more down in this frequency range, in higher frequency range. We will be much more sensitive. Okay. We had the only <coughs> Okay, so <coughs> what was needed uh, to get to this? Uh, first of all, we have had a much better seismic isolation. And this is, I keep telling you about the low frequency range, how important, but it was really important. Uh, we could not have done it without that. So there are external seismic isolation parts, and there are internal parts, the automatic seismometers, uh, everything which are internal, they have to be working compatible. And it is also very important that uh, what we are doing, that we have all these additional seismometers which give a control signal. So what we have right now is an active seismic isolation system. It's a bit different than some of the other interferometers which are being built right now, like the Rego Boys Propensive System. We have a lot of control here, and we really hope that we can really make this jump. Right now we are somewhere here, in between these two curves. This is S5, the initial LIGO, and this is where we want to get to. We are right in between right now. <coughs> uh, in this meeting, we needed to have better uh, test passes and suspension. Uh, better test passes, first of all, needed to be much more uh, rate. It's 40 kilogram test mass. We really have to work down on those further noise problems. So we have to have very good coating on that. Another thing was the suspension, which was a big change compared to the initial LIGO. We have a quadruple suspension. So there are four ranges, uh, four times the isolations <coughs> from the suspension. This is very important to suspend those mirrors, of course. And then there is the higher laser power, which I just mentioned. We are really mm -hmm. operating already much higher laser power and have much more <coughs> power in the arms. So that's the new laser. So, of course, we had to build this uh, interferometer and put that together. It's, of course, not one group, not two group. It's the full uh, collaboration. Uh, mostly MIT and Caltech, but we, Columbia, had also 
us to our chance to do <coughs> a very important work at the side. Uh, this is, for example, on the left side, this is actually our student Alexa, who switched on Milo, so she had some fun with some of the, uh, uh, I think this was done uh, when she was putting together the, the locking system for a trans There's a green laser for to that. So, that's not the figures, it's just, this is what you can imagine, how is it to work at the side. If you, you really have to get into this one and just enjoy your work, okay? Um, now, this is Alexa again. I want to show you the only thing which did not change compared to the show line, that's the vacuum system. This is the, probably the most expensive nothing on earth. This is a nice <laughs>